everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about the book Fossil Capital by Andreas Malm. This is an excellent book in which the author delves into the historical origins of our use of fossil fuels, and he elaborates uh, on how our addiction to fossil fuels is intimately connected to uh, capitalism. Uh, so I'm going to just give uh, kind of an outline of the structure of this book and some of the main arguments, uh, and then talk briefly about the significance uh, of the work. Okay, so Fossil Capital by Andreas Malm. And this book was released in 2016, uh, so it's a few, been a few years already, but uh, the arguments, I think, are uh, really fundamental and are just are as essential as ever. Okay, so looking at chapter one, the author starts with um, his outlining his attempt of what he's trying to do, which is identify the historical origins of global warming. And he identifies very early on uh, this key... Um, phenomenon that he calls the fossil economy. And he describes it in this way, an economy of self-sustaining growth predicated on the growing consumption of fossil fuels and therefore generating sustained growth in emissions of carbon dioxide. The fossil economy has the character of a totality, a distinguishable entity, a socio-ecological structure, in which a certain economic process and a certain form of energy are welded together. So what he's basically talking about here is how capitalism and our use of fossil fuels are inextricably intertwined. He also makes another uh, interesting uh, observation in chapter one, and when he refers to the dual meanings of the term power. So on the one hand, he's looking at power as an energy source, and its English meaning uh, referring to an energy source. Um, we derive power, uh, i.e. energy, from our, cons our burning of fossil fuels. But at the same time, power, of course, has another important meaning in English, which is a structure of domination uh, in human relations. So some people have power over others. And he points out that the power derived from fossil fuels was dual in meaning and nature from the very start. And this is really key to his argument in showing why early capitalists in a 19th century Great Britain especially adopted, uh, consciously adopted the use of fossil fuels <clears throat> uh, in order to uh, demonstrate power uh, over uh, labor. Okay, so I'm going to go on just to talk about some of the main arguments in Chapter 3. And Chapter 3 is important. Palm outlines um, three categories of power and what he calls prime movers. And a prime mover is a mechanism for generating mechanical power out of an energy source and putting other mechanisms in motion. So he talks about the uh, flow. Gosh darn it! Froze there for a second. Uh, talks about the flow of energy as one uh, category of power, and here he's referring to uh, especially renewable energy sources such as wind and solar. And an important uh, aspect of this type of power is that it is con conditioned in time and space, and it's dependent on weather cycles, for instance. And uh, I'll give some examples of that, or highlight some examples that that Malm raises uh, a little bit later. Um, then he uh, outlines the second category, uh, animate power, and this would be sources of energy embodied in living creatures and it's conditioned by metabolism. Uh, so humans, for example, have uh, the ability to uh, harness energy, utilize energy, uh, and to uh, 
output energy in, into producing and to making new things. Uh, we use our bodies uh, to, to make things. And so this would just be a kind of animate power. And then he talks about the third one, which is the stock. And this is a very important one uh, as well. This would be things such as fossil fuels, coal, and oil. And Mom describes this in a very interesting way, uh, calling it the heritage of past metabolism and standing outside of time. <clears throat> so fossil fuels, for instance, decayed plants uh, and animal waste in condensing over many hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years into um, <clears throat> this kind of stock of energy uh, that we then dig up and uh, burn uh, to, to release and consume uh, the energy contained there within. Um, so I'm going to just roughly kind of outline some of the key points then uh, from a range of chapters uh, between chapters 4 through 12. And there's a, a lot going on here, and what Mom basically spends most of... Uh, the time doing in these chapters is outlining the history of fossil fuels and how they came to dominate in Great Britain. Um, he clearly identifies Great Britain as the source of uh, our current fossil economy, uh, and then this is no coincidence because this is also the source of uh, industrial capitalism, and in Malm's conception, uh, the onset of capitalism and our addiction to fossil fuels and the onset of the fossil economy are uh, intimately connected. So this is where he starts his investigation. Um, and again, he raises the idea of the dual meanings of power, which in this case is capital's domination over labor and fossil fuels' role in abetting this. So then he spends these chapters outlining how this process came about. How did capital come to dominate over labor and over our lives uh, in so many ways? How did fossil fuels come, uh, you know, what role did they play in that process and how did they come to dominate uh, uh, in our economy today? One of the key points that he makes, and he gives many examples of this, is the adoption of machinery versus uh, manpower. And so he talks a lot about the cotton industry, the rise of the cotton industry, and how eventually uh, machinery rep replaces a lot of hand weaving that had been going on. Uh, now, why was this? Why did capitalists choose to in, uh, turn to using machinery in their factories instead of uh, manpower? And it's not just that the machines were better and superior in every way. Rather, as Malm points out, the machines were often just easier to control. For instance, people take more time uh, to make things, uh, but they also demand higher rate wages and better treatment. And machines do not require these things. Um, and then, as I've mentioned, it, these machines make it easier uh, for capitalists to control and to control labor. So when people, when laborers start to uh, take more time or demand higher wages and better treatment, the capitalists in many time uh, situations would just say, you know, no, we don't want to do that. Uh, and then they would fire those workers and implement machinery instead. So it's also a means of control. Um, of course, as well, these machines that we're talking about then eventually are steam powered, meaning that they burn coal uh, uh, to produce uh, steam energy. Um, but it wasn't always that way. And in fact, um, you know, many early factories uh, in, in England relied on uh, the flow, uh, as Malm would call it, and forms of renewable energy. And the main one was uh, water mills or hydroelectric power. And these were all over the English countryside. People had been uh, deriving electricity from them and power from them for uh, generations. And in fact, as Malm points out, very interestingly, uh, this type of power, hydroelectric power, was actually much cheaper to operate. Uh, so why then would 
the capitalist abandon this if it was actually cheaper. And there are numerous reasons. One of them I've already touched on is that, well, um, it had something to do with uh, uh, control of labor. But another main reason is that renewables uh, violated capitalist property relations. In other words, they were common shared property rather than the sole property of one individual. And under uh, English law, water was part of the commons that belonged to everybody. Um, you know, it, it might flow through someone's property, but then it would just flow into someone else's property eventually. Um, so no one could had the right to monopolize that uh, power, and monopolizing power and making things people's property is a fundamental part of uh, capitalist social relations and, and liberalism in general. And uh, <clears throat> you couldn't do this with, uh, with, with uh, renewable energy, and you still can't. And this is why Malm's work has uh, a lot of significance for our discussion on climate change today. So just to take a quote then from the book that uh, highlights this, um, you know, he writes, uh, well, there's a wealth of evidence that water power was in fact abundant, cheaper than steam, and technically viable at the time of the transition. But further, further massive expansion uh, on its basis appears to have foundered on the capitalist property relations of Britain. The oil of private property and water did not mix well. Um, but he also gives many other reasons for adopting fossil fuels over renewables. Uh, and again, they relate to, to forms of control and power. But one type of control that Malm outlines was a kind of spatial control. And not only did renewables violate pro capitalist property, property relations, but they were also uh, spatially conditioned, meaning that you could not move the water wheel away from its river source. Uh, <clears throat> now, capitalists obviously are developing big factories uh, in major uh, urban centers where there's a lot of people, where there's a lot of workers to be had. Um, but they're having trouble, in many cases, getting the water there. Uh, and another reason is that capital itself is fluid and mobile, and it needs to move around uh, to expand. And water power, in this case, was just not compatible with that. And then, uh, then another thing was that the fluctuations in the weather also could not be controlled. So if there is a lot of rain sometime, you might have begin driving a lot of power from, uh, from water mills. But if there was a drought and little rain at other times, you would have less uh, you'd get less power at those times. So even though fossil fuels cost more, uh, you know, they could be transported far from the source to the site of manufacturing uh, and controlled, basically, uh, um, you know, based on other kinds of fluctuations in price and according to, you know, whenever the capitalists wanted to turn on and off the machines. Um, but this kind of, uh, you know, moving... Um, power away from the source by using coal led to uh, and contributed to depopulation of the countryside and further concentration in the cities. And I've already kind of hinted at this that there was another kind of control that made fossil fuels more appealing for the capitalists, and this was temporal control. As I said, they can uh, turn the machine on and off whenever they want. But it wasn't just that um, workers themselves were also being overworked, and they were demanding shorter work hours. But a paradoxical consequence uh, of this kind of collective bargaining for shorter workdays uh, was that this required the capitalists then to produce more in a shorter amount of time. And this as well was not compatible with, uh, with the flow, with types of renewable energies like a water. So both of these things, uh, you know, further push the change to fossil fuels, which could be controlled or shut on and off at will. And he 
Malm gives a quote from a factory owner from the 1830s uh, who said, the steam engine is much more tractable and civil than the hodmen workers. Easier managed, keeps good hours, drinks no whiskey, and is never tired. So this kind of sums up, you know, um, you know why capitalists would make the switch, even though it was energy was more expensive, um, and it, it highlights very well, I think, this issue of control. Okay, so I'm going to jump ahead to then uh, chapter 13. Uh, this is where Malm gives his equation for the accumulation of fossil capital, and this draws heavily from Marx's equation of the labor theory of value and for the accumulation of capital from relative surplus value. So if the reader does not uh, have a basic level of understanding of those concepts, uh, reading this chapter of Malm's book uh, might be a bit of a challenge. Um, so probably reading uh, Marx's volume one of Capital would be, I think, certainly prerequisite. But I'll try to explain it uh, in as simple terms as possible. So Marx's basic uh, formula is CMC, and this is uh, commodity, money, money, commodity. Um, so for the worker, they have no other, they have nothing to start out with ex other than their own labor power, uh, which they sell to the capitalist in return for wages. And in the process, uh, they make, uh, you know, commodities, uh, other commodities as well, the products of their labor. So um, they would start with their labor, they would sell it as a commodity in exchange for wages and money, and then they would produce more commodities. And this uh, formula just repeats over and over. For the capitalists, though, they start out with something. They start out with money, and all they want to do is invest that money in other commodities so that they can make more money. They have no real use value for the commodity itself. It's just an exchange value, um, and in the process also of extracting uh, the worker's labor, they extract surplus value, which is uh, the origins of their profits. But anyway, that whole process, very simply, is just money, commodity, money. And it repeats over and over and over again so that the whole point of capitalism is the accumulation of more and more money uh, and capital. Um, but to, to expand, extrapolate on this simple formula, um, you know, you could, Marx also gives this formula here, which is money and then commodity and money. Um, in commodity, there's many more things, as I've hinted at, involved in this process. For, for example, the input of labor power plus uh, the means of production. These are owned by the capitalists. Um, and then the actual production of the commodity itself. And it's in this arena, this uh, CPC arena here, which is the origin of profit, uh, which in this case, in Marxist terminology, is basically just accumulated surplus value or, or uh, extra labor power provided by the worker to the capitalist when subtracted from the worker's wages. Uh, so there's uh, much more could be said about this, um, which uh, we don't have time to go into here, uh, but basically the capitalist needs to have the worker uh, work the requisite amount of hours to pay off, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that they need to uh, pay their wage to get their wages, and then anything worked over that amount uh, is all extra. Um, so the, the, labor is all, the labor is always putting in more uh, than is actually covered by all of the wages, and that's where profit comes from, basically. <laughs> but with fossil capital, as Malm shows, fossil fuels become intertwined in this production process. So he kind of revises the formula so that it's MCL plus PM, um, but then here there's fossil fuels uh, in, you know, that go into the machinery, the means of production, uh, and then out of the production process is released a CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels. So this becomes inextricably intertwined with this whole production process that is fundamental for the reproduction of capital. Um, moreover, Malm actually uh, gives a much more complex formula for this, which I don't have time to go into here, 
But it's important to note that fossil fuels like coal are themselves also commodities which are exchanged or obtained through exploited human labor for the production of surplus value, so that they too become inseparable from a web of commodities and exchange values. And Malm refers to this as the primitive accumulation of fossil capital. Um, okay, and, and then in sum, as I've already mentioned then, this the point of this chapter then is basically just to show how um, renewables are, are incompatible with capitalism because uh, A, they belong to everyone equally, uh, B, they can't be controlled in time and space, and C, they require no labor to produce, uh, or i.e. no profit for the capitalists. So um, the sun and uh, water and wind, um, they're freely avail available for everyone to take, meaning that no money can be derived from them, really. Okay, moving on to chapters 14 through 16. Um, <clears throat> so here, then, Malm kind of brings us up to date, basically. He investigated in earlier chapters the history of fossil fuels and their adoption in Great Britain. Uh, and then he goes on, in, in the latter half of the book, then, to look at um, our contemporary situation, and especially... Um, the key emitter, or the largest emitter of uh, fossil fuels today, which is China. Uh, and he call, says China as the chimney of the world. But what's important to point out is that, uh, as Malm notes, most of China's CO2 emissions are produced by foreign-owned businesses producing commodities for consumption uh, in Japan, the U.S., and Europe. Um, and so... Uh, so in essence, basically, uh, you know, uh, China as the factory of the world, uh, we often hear, you know, producing goods uh, for the foreign market, and then in the process, of course, as Malm has already showed uh, through his formula of fossil capital, uh, that this uh, entails massive emissions of CO2. Um, why do foreign-owned businesses choose to... Uh, have China play this role? Well, there's different reasons. One is the has been the abundance of cheap labor in China, uh, but it's not enough just to have cheap labor. The capitalist also needs roads and, uh, you know, seaports and everything else, uh, electricity infrastructure and all of these things uh, that are necessary uh, to create a, a relatively stable export-oriented uh, infrastructure and facilitate uh, the the kind of flow of commodities out of the country. Um, but this also then shows the class dimensions to climate change. Um, and Malm really attacks the idea of the Anthropocene uh, the, and the idea that, you know, we um, <laughs> or humans are all equally responsible for climate change. So Malm uh, vehemently denies this. And through his formula of uh, the fossil economy and his examination of the history of the fossil economy show, shows that, uh, you know, it's not everyone equally, it's some capitalists and businesses and Western consumers have uh, more or most of the responsibility um, for uh, climate change and CO2 emissions. But then he asks, you know, um, well, then why do we not abandon fossil fuels? If we know that they're bad for us, um, why don't we just stop consuming them? And here he draws on Althusser's um, arguments of ideology and ideological state apparatuses to describe how uh, the consumption of fossil fuels has become a part of our daily lives, just like capitalism and uh, you know buying and selling goods has become a part of our daily lives. That is very hard to then just um, you know, uh, you know, totally remove. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, moreover, then, you know, in a materialist conception of history and the construction of identity, um, you know, we express our identities through our actions. And it, in capitalism, this means through our buying uh, and, and purchasing power, essentially. Um, so he highlights some examples of how the fossil economy has basically been made a part of our identity. And he might talk about, like, imagine a, 
a family trip in the car, a road trip, and, you know, stopping at a gas station and filling up, and then all the other memories that kind of go along with this family trip, right? But they're all centered around this fossil fuel consuming car, um, but they become a key part of our memories and identities too. And this is similar to kind of gathering around the hearth, like the fireside, and just sitting around the fire and having chats with friends. But, um, you know, these are coal burning furnaces, basically, that we're talking about here. Um, and so then he says, whereas most of the mainstream uh, climate change discourse focuses on fighting climate change through individual consumer actions, uh, this is not going to be enough. And what he wants to do is take the focus and, and this uh, idea of, of, you know, the individual fighting climate change really takes the focus off those who are most responsible. Uh, and the idea of changing our consumer actions, fighting climate change through our changing our consumer actions, um, ignores uh, where most of the CO2 is released through acts of production. And moreover, then, treating this as an individual choice uh, ignores the unequal social relations inherent in capitalism. So some conclusions, then, that he draws uh, at the end of the book would be a return to the flow, renewables, in this case, solar, wind, uh, hydroelectric, these types of things. Um, but, he, of course, as he's outlined, this is not compatible with capitalist relations, uh, so therefore, he says, um, states must uh, limit the power of private corporations and directly take action. And he, call, he refers to this as a planned economy for power. So corporations themselves aren't willingly going to change. They're not willingly going to just throw away all of, this, all of this capital and all of these investments that they've made. Um, we need actual laws. We need people to uh, become involved politically uh, and to exercise power through states that, um, that, that limit the power of private corporations uh, to continue emitting CO2. Um, the significance of this work, it's hard to fully capture all of it because there's so much, um, but as I've mentioned already, it shows how fossil fuels are intertwined with capitalist development and it's hard to separate one from the other. Uh, this, therefore, then demonstrates the need for so to change socioeconomic conditions, to change these unequal uh, power relations inherent in capitalism. And the work overall sheds doubt on the different ideas of green capitalist solutions, and not to mention different ideas of geoengineering, in that they're not enough to fundamentally alter, and sometimes they just replicate even further unequal social relations under capitalism, uh, let alone save uh, the climate. Okay, so I'm going to end the talk there, and um, I hope this, uh, my review of the book has been helpful. Uh, again, it's a fantastic uh, book. It's a uh, it's a, as, a, as a work of history, I think it also has tremendous significance. Amalm is a fantastic um, historian who really knows how to use uh, historical records to make a very relevant uh, point for our contemporary situation. Okay, so thanks a lot for listening and uh, looking forward to our next talk.